morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Sean, Dunn. Sean Dunn. I'm an Enterprise Agile Coach with IHS, and this is my colleague, Chris Edwards. Hey. And he's uh, also worked with me from IHS. Um, and this presentation is called The Seven Sins of Scrum and Other Agile Anti-Patterns. And it was put together by uh, um, Todd Little and the, and the three of us. Um, Todd's the VP of Product Development um, at IHS. Most people have never heard of our company, and that's OK. Um, and what we do is we provide information, data, and analytics to a variety of industries, including uh, um, energy, aerospace, um, defense, uh, transport. Uh, we've got some team somewhere that uh, breaks down iPhones and iPads and figures out exactly how much it costs to produce. So that's kind of cool. So most people have never heard of us, but we do a lot of interesting things. Uh, we're from Canada, uh, right there in Calgary. So that's where we're from. So a little bit of a disclaimer is that uh, we talk, this is the seven sins of Scrum, uh, but there's not, there's not actually exactly seven. They're not necessarily sins, and it isn't necessarily limited to, to just Scrum, um, but we did kind of break things into broad seven broad categories, and what are we really trying to say? Um, well, the Agile Manifesto says that you know, we are uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others to do it. And the authors, I think, had a really insightful way of doing this, is saying, we value these things, but if you want to value something, we have to be very aware of what things we are willing to maybe sacrifice. You can't have a value without having some kind of cost to it. So while we value the things on the right, um, we, we value the things on the left more. And so this presentation is based a lot on our experience of working with teams and identifying lots of, um, we call it anti-patterns. Um, and what is an anti-pattern? Uh, Jim Copeland described it as an anti-pattern. is something that looks like a good idea, but which backfires uh, badly when applied. And you know, anti-pattern sounds a little bit negative, but what we're really trying to say is that um, there's, we, we really want teams to be great. We, where we work with teams and want teams to be great, but oftentimes they'll adopt practices or they'll not quite understand things and it, it'll limit them. Right? They'll, they'll just be, they'll be good, but we want to help them become great. So we were looking for what are some of these patterns that we've observed. Um, and so this is, the, uh, this is the auditor's manifesto, which is uh, we develop process, or we value process and tools over individuals and interactions. It's, it's everything flipped because that is, while there may be value for the items on the right, we have chosen to ignore them because they are difficult to audit. We only care about the items on the left because we can measure them, and because we care about them, we will make you make sure you do too. Uh, the format for this talk is, is going to be uh, the Sinner's Manifesto, which is what are some, you know, call them potential sins, some things that might be, might be limiting. If you're doing these, it's not necessarily bad, but it might prevent you from, uh, from becoming great. And so it might be okay in, in moderation. Everything's, you know, everything's better in moderation, including collaboration. Um, but uh, in excess, it can be an anti-pattern. So what we propose is some virtues on the right-hand side that would be a, um, would, would help teams potentially overcome this. And Agile is all about learning. By iterating, we can learn, we can learn faster, and um, we like this quote from Galileo, God has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect. He has not intended us to forgo, forgo their use. So in everything we do in, in learning, uh, we, we want to apply our reason and intellect. So we do encourage everybody to do that. Okay, so I'm, is this working? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the first uh, sort of uh, sin category is uh, process and tools over individuals and interactions. And this is the only one that really is, is based off the manifesto. Um, and the reason we have this first is because a lot of times we see companies doing an agile transformation and they'll really focus on adopting these scrum practices and I'm, I'm using Rally and therefore now I am agile. Uh, but really in, in complex software projects, we want, we want to bring projects to teams and, and uh, allow So uh, this is a great version of the uh, Agile Manifesto um, from Alex Kravitsky, which is blah, 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 blah. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools, blah, 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 blah. So if you take nothing else away from the manifesto, it's about 
individuals and interactions and teams and how they interact. And oftentimes we somehow get, this gets missed. You know, we, we, we get kind of focused on um, how, do we, you know, how do we implement the tool. So yeah, the, an often one we see is, is like, okay, agile transformation. Okay, let's roll out a new tool and then everybody comes really, really hyper-focused on how do we use the tool properly. You know, we need to be using the tool the same way. We really need to be, you know, teams need to be using the tool now as opposed to really understanding, you know, what agility means. And all these tools and processes are all in support of agility. They're not a means to them. And this relates to Agile as a, as a mindset. So uh, this is a frequent, you know, frequent thing we'll see where teams will get, again, hype, kind of hyper-focused on Agile is a, is a process we need to implement. I, even at this conference and even with teams we work with, I don't know how many times I'll hear, quote, unquote, the Agile process, right? And that, that usually causes a funny reaction on my face. Um, and it's, it's really helping teams understand that it, it is a mindset. These are values. And what do we mean by values is they influence behaviors and decisions um, on a, pretty much everything we do across software development. When you're sitting at your desk programming, you're making micro decisions on a moment by moment basis. And what are all those, what are we valuing in each one of those decisions? And it's the values from, the values and principles from the manifesto. So it's understanding that these values really um, per permeate you know, all of our behaviors and decisions and actions throughout our work. So has anyone ever been part of a committee or group that uh, was there to define some best practices for the company? So the word, I don't really like this word best practice because it, it implies there's no better practice. We've already arrived at the best practice. And it also kind of sounds like, well, every practice, this practice is good for everyone. You know, we have different contexts. Maybe one team is, is co-located and the other one's distributed. So how, how can we say that that uh, this same practice will work best for both teams. So like Sean was saying, if, if we start from the values and principles and see are these practices enabling us to you know, deliver frequent value to our customer, um, then, then really we can, we can find uh, what works best in each situation. And I mentioned at the beginning that Agile's you know, all about learning, right? So what kind of value does that communicate to your organization where we say, we need to implement these best practices that have been somehow figured out elsewhere, right? That, that's hugely disempowering, where it's like there's, there's experts out there who've developed these best practices and we just need to implement it. The thing that really resonated with me when I really started understanding you know, Agile and working with Agile companies was, ah, I can contribute. I can discover new things. It's not, it's not a society of experts who have discovered everything and I just need to follow what they're doing, but I can be a contributor to the expanding body of knowledge. That's a, yeah. a hugely empowering environment to be working in. Yeah, mob programming, uh, uh, Nersh doesn't like it, but uh, that's fine. Uh, it was invented or discovered by a group of people doing everyday work, uh, slowly uh, looking at what they're doing, trying different things. Uh, you know, we're all growing and involving our agile our agile mindset and processes and discovering new and better ways of doing things, so. And whether you agree with mob programming or not, um, it was uh, invented, by, uh, invented by Hunter and it works for them and it works for them in their context and they discovered it through experimentation. And the really interesting question is, what was it that enabled them to experiment with things? Like what was it in their culture and their way of doing things that actually allowed them to come to new discoveries? Forget about what the discovery was or whether you agree with it, but that they came to new discoveries on their own. Yeah, and, and I have a, a friend that works at Hunter and, and I was asking him, oh, can you do a presentation for my company? Um, you know, we'd really like to learn about mob programming and they're, very, they're actually very hesitant because they're, they're worried people are just gonna take it and be like, oh, now we've implemented mob programming and now we are doing mob programming. And without, you know, if somebody just implements this, 
this new uh, best, way, practice. best practice without understanding what are all the things that led to it, uh, they, might, they might miss the point entirely and, and implement something that doesn't work for them. And I think we covered this, is the idea of one size fits all versus context. So believing that, we just have to take you know, Scrum as it is out of the book or Kanban as it is out of the book and it will fit in all situations, in all environments. But really teaching teams to appreciate the context within, what they, within uh, their work environment and how to really understand and assess all these different techniques and tools that are out there and how they may apply or may not apply within their own context. All right, status over flow of value. The key to this one is really that, that a lot of times we are looking at, at metrics and, and things in our system that are really uh, looking back. Uh, metrics that are, are making us feel better about how we did, but not giving us any information about how we can deliver better flow of value to our customers. So how can we look at different things that we're doing, all the different things we're doing, uh, and identify the ones that aren't really contributing to delivering value to our customer and eliminate them. And one way of uh, doing this is, is always being kind of focused on the rear view mirror, you know, always looking back. And, and the status is often about looking backwards, right? It's, it's looking, well, how, where are we right now and how did we get here? As opposed to, okay, what is it going to take us to deliver value and move forwards? And so much of it kind of comes from maybe a traditional project manager report of, okay, what's the status of things, what the, what's the progress of things? And we want to try and get teams to shift the conversation towards, okay, what do we need to do next to deliver value and, and move that forward? Oh yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of metrics we gather, you know, we, we do tasks and we gather estimates. And a lot of this is focused around individual performance and not performance, not performance of the system itself. And what we really care about is how effective is the team at delivering value? I, do I really care about the individual utilization of any one person on the team if my team as a whole is not being successful? So ask yourself, what kind of things in your work environment do you do intentionally, maybe unintentionally, that might incentivize this, incentivize this behavior? Who uses tasks? and keeps track of tasks and individual tasks. Is that contributing to a you know, team taking ownership over stories, or does it encourage you know, individuals trying to complete tasks? Um, even individ individual ownership of stories is another way. It's like, well, I got my story done. Well, wait a second, they're actually team stories. So becoming really self-reflective of things we may do in our workplace that might actually encourage this over um, the team taking collective ownership over uh, getting things done. Yeah, if, if helping Sean is actually going to make me deliver my task later, and I'm going to get in trouble for that, am I going to help him? Probably not. I had a conversation with a team about that, right? So um, they're having their they're having their their their, their stand up, and, and someone was uh, great on them for bringing for being transparent and forthcoming and saying. This user story I was working on, it looks like it's going to be longer than we first thought. Um, so, you know, it might, it might take, you know, a significantly large portion of time. And then the conversation just kind of went on to the next person. I was like, whoa, 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 wait, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. So, why is no one kind of volunteering to help? Like, this was clearly the most important thing, like, this was the highest priority thing. Um, and we thought it was going to be easy, which is fine. We were wrong, not a problem. But now what are we going to do about it? And, and the team member said, well, I can't help because then I won't get my tasks done. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm busy. I'm <laughs> it's like, well, manager, all, if you tell me. Busy. <laughs> <laughs> and so here was a team that had been practicing, you know, practicing Agile and Scrum, but did not really understand the, the fundamental of the team ownership of user stories. They were still um, thinking in terms of individual, uh, individual work. All right, so uh, stories, over, stories over strategy. Um, I've come across this on uh, uh, projects before where um, teams will be working on stories but with no kind of understanding of why. And not only is there no kind of understanding of why, it's not connected with, okay, how is this actually going to meet some higher level objective within the company? Are we going to you know, increase revenue, decrease costs, reduce risk? Like what, how, how is this story going to ultimately achieve that? 
And that makes a huge, huge, huge difference because you may split stories in fundamentally wildly different ways depending on what your strategy is. And so when the team doesn't have any concept of what that strategy is, and they're just kind of like blindly chugging through stories, um, you can run into some um, you know, situations where, hey, our output is huge. We got, you know, have high velocity, deliver lots of user stories, but ultimately weren't connected with any kind of strategy. So on our, on our teams, like, I've been a member of a team, I've been a developer on a team, and we tend to encounter a large number of what I like to call like micro decisions. These aren't like, do I work on this user story or do I not work on this user story, but there's little tiny decisions we make within user stories, within items of work, um, that without, without a picture of a, of a grander picture, do I understand, should I do this or should I not? And these things pile up very quickly, little small amounts of extra work. Well, I might default to, well, I better do it, because you know, if I don't do it, then the customer might not be happy. So this, this leads to this, there's this thinking of, of we need to, to build these buckets of work. Um, but if we have a strategy that helps us decide what not to do, we can limit the amount of work done and still achieve the same outcome, then we're actually going to be more productive and get more done. So if any of you are familiar with user story mapping? Yeah. So to me, this is, that's a great tool. Um, Jeff Patton's book, User Story Mapping, read it. And it's a way of, of looking at, at workflows and uh, how to deliver value to the user and ultimately prioritize your work. And, and, and what don't I have? If I had to ship this today, what, don't I ha what can I throw out the side uh, to still deliver that same outcome? And so strategy should tell you what you're not going to do. If a strategy can't tell you what you're not going to do, it's not really a strategy. And we're sometimes guilty of this, and features are a great, uh, a great example where we bucket things into features. Well, all these user stories are kind of all related, so we'll bucket them into features, and then these become these macro decisions. Well, do I choose this feature or this feature? Well, that's actually kind of a false decision, well, right? I have, I have to get it all done anyway. I have to get it all done anyway. So I might as well just do them all, you know. Where what we really want is to, okay, well, how do we, what, what decision filters can we provide so that people can make micro decisions? How do I choose, choose between this feature or this user story from this feature or this user story from this feature, which would deliver value uh, a lot faster? Which, as Chris mentioned, I got to have it all. <laughs> this all or nothing, this all or nothing mentality um, over the idea of having minimum viable products. And we've seen development teams who've been told, well, you've got to have it in the, we got, we're not going to release until we get this all done. You know, product management will say, we can't release until we get this all done. And then that leads to very lazy thinking and very lazy prioritization. And then guess what inevitably happens? They change their mind and you're partially way through and they're saying, we need to ship now. Can you have two top priorities? No. <laughs> <laughs> And so we were. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Could you say again, please? Okay, that's. Um, maybe we'll talk afterwards because I just want to make sure I understand your context correctly before I give a simple answer to that. So, yeah, great question. It was um, if a product manager asks for an estimate for a big thing, and then we give them an estimate and they build some plan off of that. Is that the you know how do you what do you do in that situation, right? So, um, yeah, if we, if we could talk afterwards, I'd like to understand your context. Thank you. I touched on this a little bit, um, this idea of focusing on tasks versus stories. So tasks are a great thing uh, if you're uh, really into micromanagement. Because I can track people's hours, I can, I can look exactly what their output is. Did you, did you meet your estimate? You said this was going to take five hours and it took you six. What happened there? <laughs> so th this leads to focusing on individual output, individual performance rather than team performance. Which, by the way, you can do with stories. I've seen, I've seen teams that, that uh, you know, here's Sean's story, and, and here's Shane's story, and, and here's Chris's story. Um, so you can still get this with, um, but I, I think the idea here is what we really want to focus on is team value delivery. How are we as a team delivering value? So I, I would actually encourage anyone here who does tasks on their team, run an experiment. 
Just try not doing that for a while. Let the team figure out the details. So I think we'll get to this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very good question. So the question was, if, if, if we don't have tasks, how do we track things? How do we track progress? And, and, I, and I think we'll get to this. And it's somewhat related to a previous slide about status versus value delivery, like looking backwards as opposed to what can we do to move forwards and, and deliver value in the form of story. So yeah, we'll get to that. All right, uh, another one is uh, following, overs, uh, following orders over um, understanding, understanding why. And we'll often encounter this in situations where teams will be very used to just, oh, tell me, you know, just you give me the user stories, tell me what to do, and I will gladly go off and do that. And why is that not a good environment, or not a good uh, environment to, that uh, su enables, supports agility? And here's my explanation. I spent 14 years in the Canadian Army Reserves as an Army officer, um, and there's this misconception that the Army is very, you know, we call it command and control. You, you take order, you give orders, you take orders, you do as you're told. That is wildly false. And the reason is, war is this complex, changing, chaotic, you know, situation. And if you're waiting, and if someone tells you orders and you just blindly go off and do them, the, the situation is going to change, and you're going to have to make decisions on the fly, and you need to understand the bigger picture, the overall intent, because when, you need to, when, when you're told to cross a bridge and the bridge no longer exists, what do you do? You need to call back to headquarters, well maybe the radio's broken, so what do you do? You need to understand the bigger picture, and that decentralized of control, that decentralized of decision making speeds decisions. We talk about the micro decisions that are made on a daily basis. So we really, really try to work with developers and, and coach them and help them feel comfortable with asking why. If, you, if, you're a, if you're a development team that has a customer embedded in your team, that is the greatest experience ever. Most of us don't have that luxury. Now, but if we can figure out a way of injecting the, the, the mind of the user into our developers so that they really understand what the user's trying to accomplish, they're gonna make much better decisions. Um, I really liked, so I don't know if any of you saw the talk uh, by Richard yesterday in the morning. He was talking about how they actually send out uh, anthropologists into the, into the customer's world so they can get a really deep understanding of them. I thought that was fantastic. So one thing you can do as an experiment is, is listen. When you go back to your teams, just pay attention and listen. When you're talking about user stories and doing backlog grooming or planning, listen to the types of questions that are being asked. What types of questions are developers asking? Are they asking, you know, what to do? Are they asking, you know, for definition on specifically how they're to implement something? Are they asking questions to help them get a better understanding of, of why you would want to do this? What outcomes are really being, uh, uh, trying to be achieved? How are we doing for time? Halfway. All right, uh, this one's one of my personal favorites. Uh, this, this isn't part of the manifesto, but um, this is actually Uncle Bob Martin, one of the original signatories, wishes that this was the fifth value on the manifesto, uh, craftsmanship over crap. There is, a, there is a principle about technical mastery, but a lot of the original signatories feel that, that maybe we, they could have had a bit more emphasis on this. Because uh, we, can, we can focus on delivery. Delivering value is great, but if what's under the hood is a pile of crap, then we are not going to be sustainable in the long run. Velocity over quality. Um, lots of teams have this belief that, okay, our job is to increase velocity. Velocity is this thing that we can just improve and improve and get better. And in fact, if we're not increasing velocity, somehow we are not doing well as a team. We're failing as a team if we're at least not increasing or if our velocity is wildly varying and uh, that's, that's a bit of a misconception. Um, velocity can vary and does vary and doesn't actually even get better. Um, and we, talked, we had a talk on that yesterday. Um, so the belief that, well, velocity is what we care about when we actually care about delivering quality products over, that reduce the total cost of ownership over the life, the total lifespan, that's, that's more important than getting hyper-focused on this velocity metric. 
So this is the you know testing theorem. I think this was made first made or made famous by Mike Cohn. Um, so yeah, testing quality in versus building quality in. So I, you know, going back to being busy, individual utilization. Developers are always busy, right? Well, let's not let's not waste their time with this testing thing. Well, we have people for that. We'll just we'll just get them over here and we'll start building lots of manual tests. And then what happens? Well, I mean, manual tests are expensive, right? And now I'm going to have to to do them a lot. Um, and now I have this giant regression cycle. So, well, logically, we should automate them, right? Well, okay, well, we've got people that can build UI automation, but they don't really understand the code. So, well, it makes more sense to just build some automated GUI tests, and we'll just like build an army of, of UI autom automators, and, and we'll build this amazing test suite. Um, but what happens? They break a lot, they're slow, and they're not really giving us any real feedback about what when we when we break things in the code because the, the most op, the most optimal time to identify a bug that we inject is the second I write it. So what do we want to do? We want to focus on on building automated unit tests, integration tests. This is less important. They add value, but they don't add as much value. Um, I would actually there there aren't many things I would say this about in Agile, but I would actually say that if you're not doing some form of automated unit tests or integration tests, that you really cannot be Agile. So, uh, how many people here like work towards some kind of deadline of some kind? Like there's some date on the calendar that something has to be done by. Is that pretty common? Okay, sounds pretty common. So. Um, here's a story um, that there was a deadline that the uh, project manager ignored. This was the four Taurus, four Taurus, four in, Taurus in, yeah. in the, I believe, 80s. 86. So, um, product manager for the four Taurus took his time to understand the market, do market research, do all the things right to make sure that the thing they were building, you know, really would succeed in the market. And he completely missed his deadline. He was six months late. But the car was a wild success in the market. It, he got the, it achieved the outcome of wild, wild um, market success, but what, the, what was the outcome? He missed the deadline, so he was demoted. So what did the next product manager do for the next iteration of the car? He made sure above all else that he met that date. And that car was a wild disaster, right? So that we, by, by creating these dates, we have this idea that, well, this is this, is this firm date, but in reality, Things are a lot more fuzzy than that. So understand your cost of delay. If you are one day late delivering this, what is the cost of that? In some cases, and we talked to Spotify, uh, we, we were talking with people from Spotify last year, and they've got some things that has to hit the Christmas season. If it's one day after Christmas, there's absolutely no value to it. It has a very steep cost of delay curve. Like If you don't get it done by that date, it's, it's hard. Most projects aren't like that. Lots of ones, if it's one day more, but you can get this much more value, then make it one day more. And so understanding this context of the, uh, uh, what, what, what's your cost of delay curve is, uh, is really important, and not creating these artificial, um, uh, these artificial drops that don't really exist in practice. And one more thing I want to say on that is, think about what, what, do, what is your organization reward? Do you, do you reward people who deliver on their deadlines, or do you reward people who build high-quality products that achieve, the that achieve the outcome you're looking for? So I was talking about this gentleman over here. I was picking on him. Did you, did you, did you meet your estimate? OK. Well, why, why didn't you meet your estimate? Uh, because what he was building was more complex than what we can talk about. OK, but you didn't meet your estimate. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, the questions we ask people imply the values that we care about. We tend to go to developers and say, oh, we need you to get more done. And we go to testers and be like, make sure there's no bugs in the software. So what are the developers going to care about? Are they going to care about the quality of the software? No, the developers are going to care about getting more code out, sacrificing qual you know, in, uh, intrinsic quality for, for the long term. Testers are going to detect more bugs because of it. And then there's, you just end up with this, you know, Again, you've, you've lost team ownership because now they're just pointing fingers at each other because you've asked them different questions and therefore communicated that different values to each group. Right. So, so Ford, there, there was a, a, a knowledge in the company that, well, if you deliver on your timelines, that's how you're going to get a promotion. Nothing else matters. So what are people going to optimize for? 
Yeah, so I think, I think this might address the question. So, so there's this idea that, that in an iteration, we need, we need tasks and we need task estimates in order to be able to track the, prod, the, the, the progress of, of the team on that iteration. So actually, it's really easy to, to get my estimates to follow this line, but that doesn't really tell me anything. All it tells me is I'm working. I'm busy. Yep, still busy, boss. But the, re the reality is that there's a, a huge amount of variability in how long stories take. So I might take, I might take a three-point story, and some of them will take me a day, and some of them will take me a week. Um, maybe that's okay, because in the long run, it's all going to cancel out. What we really care about is the progress over a release. How much value have I delivered? How much value do I think I need this, this, this uh, top curve? And, and where do I think I'm going to be done? And this is a long-term long -term forecasting versus sort of short-term management of, of uh, tasks and hours and, and what are people doing. What we really want to do is trust the teams to get the work done and then forecast long-term where we think we're going to be at. Good question. I think that's a nice segue into the next, or it's, it's, I think it's coming. It's coming up. <laughs> that's our answer for everything. We'll talk about we'll that We'll talk later. about that later, yeah. Um, So another aspect of this is, is um, I think we kind of covered this, fo uh, focusing on commitment, and we need to make commitments, and commitments are the most important thing. Well, does commitment have any correspondence to what it means to be like motivated and doing the right things? Uh, we really want to be focusing on value. Or does everybody have the same idea of what value is? And are we all, at every moment, doing the right thing to be focusing and generating on value, generating value? Um, and, and commitments can influence decision. And we talk, like, talked about fixed scope, fixed schedule. Those are all things that we can do that can influence decisions. But are we influencing decisions in the way that we want? Are we influencing the right decisions? The right has, decisions. Has anyone been in a, you know, you work in an iteration, um, and you're getting near the end, and, okay, I don't want to start a big thing, so I'll go hunt down the backlog, and I'll find something small, and I'll work on it. What if that's like a really low value thing? Am I just working on it? Am I working on it because it's valuable to the client or am I working on it because I'm gonna meet my commitment and if I don't meet my commitment, my boss is gonna get mad at me? Iterations are artificial. We invented them. <laughs> we made them up. And that does not say they're not useful, but understand what they're useful for. Because you can also use them in ways that influence decisions in a, in a way that's suboptimal. Why would I? Yeah, we're not saying iterations are bad. What we want to think it. is, how are these iterations, how are these commitments influencing our decisions, and do we understand um, whether or not that those are the optimal decisions? Uh, that's it. Um, okay, I think, I think we've kind of touched on this a bunch, this idea of capacity planning, which is all about looking at individual utilization. Um, what we really care about is team performance. I don't think we need to say anything else on that. All right, so the next category of sins is uh, this category number six, which is illusion over reality. So what kind of things are we doing to fool ourselves? And, and don't get us wrong, we're not saying tasks themselves are bad. They can definitely be used for good. Um, put in the wrong hands, they can become, they can be used for evil. Uh, they're, they're a micromanager's dream. Um, I, in fact, I've seen, I've seen cases where, where tasks enable collaboration and enable teamwork. I, had a, I worked with a team where, where they were really uncomfortable, two people working on a story. Um, but then we sat down and, and broke down the work that was involved in the story. We're like, oh, well, we, okay, well, there's ways that we can collaborate and work on this together. And yeah, yeah, I, definitely there's value to them. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
So you're delighting the product owner by delivering them something. challenge you and say, but there was something much higher priority that was the next on the backlog, and you had an opportunity to get a one day or two day head start on the next highest priority thing that the product owner determined was the next highest thing. So. I think the key here is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's thinking, yeah, now you're thinking about value delivery. How do I optimize value delivery versus yeah. how do I meet my so, commitments and, and make my boss happy? So I, th I think with a lot of these questions, it's, it's, it's great because it's like know why you're doing something, right? So if you know why, the, if the team understands why they're, you know, in tasks or something that they want to do because it helps them do their work, then great. If the prioritization of the user stories was done because it delivers value, then then great, but understand why you're doing what you're doing. We go back to the Galileo quote, like let's use our reason and intellect. Yeah. Great questions. Um, this is great. Okay, so there was this comment about, okay, if we're, if we're not doing, now that we're doing this sort of, this is a, is everyone know, uh, familiar with release burnups, not iteration burnups? Is anyone not familiar with them? Good. Okay. So, so a lot of times we'll do the the release burn up, and we'll for, we'll get some kind of velocity on here, and we'll look at okay how much how much how many user point story points do we have left to deliver, and I will sort of draw this horizontal line, and then I will forecast, and this is when I'm going to be done. If you look at this chart, we have this continual scope creep. It's kind of growing along the time. Just as we've been delivering, the amount of scope that we have left has been increasing. Um, I don't think scope creep is inherently bad. Uh, we're always discovering new value that we think we need to deliver. What's important is that th this, the cost of the scope creep is not put onto the development teams. This is really, do we, do we work on this, is a business decision. And what we want to do is find ways to be transparent to our business partners and show them the, the cost of this scope creep. Because if you, if you can say, if we continue adding scope in the way that we've been adding, we will be done way out here. Would you like to keep doing that? So it's having those adult conversations as we have it with the business. How do we enable, what kind of tools can we use to provide transparency, provide those, or facilitate those adult conversations and help them make, make them aware of the consequences of uh, the, the, the trade-offs of decisions. Right. So, you know, people on the business side want, they want fixed time and fixed scope usually. But what we want to do is, is find ways of having conversations with them to provide them options. Would you like to have this amount of functionality on this date, or would you like to uh, uh, finish sooner, or what, what, what kind of options do you want? But you, we want to figure out ways to not push those decisions onto the development team. We want to have these interactive conversations with the business. Okay, pass it over, please. Okay. Um, so another one is, is vanity metrics over decision metrics. What kind of things? What kind of things are we measuring, and why do we care about them? And loft, oftentimes, what we'll do is we'll um, measure things because it makes us, you know, feel good or makes us look good or something like that. I've talked to teams within our own company, and um, they'll say like, "Well, we do." Or they kind of come as this epiphany, like, "Oh, well, we do these things because it kind of makes the numbers work out, right?" Like they're, they're making decisions and making behaviors because they feel like, well, this is how we make the numbers work. And that wasn't useful for any decision. That was the key. They didn't understand what decision this information was driving. And without uh, having a decision, information is useless. If information doesn't influence any decision, it's absolutely useless information. So what do we really care about is decision metrics. What decisions do we have to make at the individual level, at the team level, at, at a portfolio level? What decisions do we have to make and what information do we need and how do we get that and how do we make those decisions better? Um, yeah, and one thing I'll add to that is uh, Sean did a talk yesterday on no estimates and, and one of the questions you asked was what decisions are enabling, are we enabling by gathering estimates? And I, don't, I think, I think that well, we could go down a rabbit hole if we start talking about no estimates, but I just want people to think about it as an activity on their own. Think about, it's, it's, a, it's a very hard one actually to, to, take, to take this concept of, of estimates and map it back to some underlying 
decision that we're trying to make. And if we don't understand what that decision is, are we wasting time gathering those metrics? Because it does cost. Great. Last, ca last category, potential last category. Okay. okay. Organizational hacks over leadership. So are we, are we just putting out fires and doing little tweaks to our organization to, to fix short-term problems? Or are we understanding the values and principles of our organization and how our current structures are not meeting them and embedding leadership into the company to solve those problems over time? I really believe that we need to be thinking about how do we build a self-sustaining organization over the long term. If these are truly values and principles, it's not just something the development team does. They are embedded at all levels, and we have to make sure that they get passed from one generation to another to another, and that we can teach you know, future generations of people and leaders at all levels really understand them because it's their job to develop the people underneath them in these values and principles. Um, and so we need to be sure, we need to be aware of what kind of things are we doing are just kind of like organizational hacks to get wrong around organizational dysfunction um, and start thinking about, thinking long term is how do we build the organization that really internalizes this. The, the path to waterfall is led by many, many rational decisions. I think, I, I think I'm going to need more um, details of examples, but maybe we'll take that offline afterwards. Yeah. We've just got a couple minutes left, so we'll just quickly go through um, some examples of organizational hacks for leadership. And, and one is controlling input, micro, micromanagement. Um, and what we really want is controlling outcomes um, and managing outcomes. And I'm a, an electrical engineer, so I'm familiar with uh, uh, control systems. And what you really want to do is you know, create these feedback loops, create these uh, um, create these uh, stable systems by using feedback loops, which can handle complexity much, much better than very um, input-oriented systems. Yeah, Dave Marquette, uh, turn the ship around. He talks about specifying goals, not methods, and this goes back to: Do we understand what? Do I understand the why behind it, and can I fill in the blanks? Go to fast forward a little bit. Um, certification over qualification. This is might be a controversial one. I, we don't have a problem with certification. Like I've got, I don't know how many letters after my name that I don't really care about. I like learning, and that's important to me. Um, certification's the byproduct of the your certification's learning. Certification's the byproduct of, of the learning. Um, unfortunately, some companies can get a little bit, um, maybe uh, hyper-focused on the certification. And what that does is we encourage that, and we say, this is something we value. We value certification, which if you've um, um, read the book about um, you know, fixed versus growth mindset, which is I've, Carol Dweck mindset. Yeah, yeah uh, Carol Dweck. Um, and it, it can reinforce the fixed mindset. Oh, I have the certification now, I know everything. As opposed to, we want people who have the idea of, ah, oh, there's so much more out there. We want to learn and grow. Yeah, we're, we're actually looking internally because we, we, there's a lot of buzz in our company about certification. So we're, we're looking at some different ones. One of the ones we're looking at is IC Agile, which is not, not like well known in the industry. So people are like, well, well the, is, this gonna, I'm gonna, is anyone gonna care about this on my resume? Um, and so we ask, well, if you, if you don't learn anything, you don't. If this isn't gonna like build your knowledge, do you really care about the certification? So um, think about it. Understand what you really what you really value in organization. What things you're doing to incentivize or disincentivize. So our summary: those were the seven broad categories, and the virtuous path is use retrospectives. Always do retrospectives. Uh, improve incre incrementally and get coaching as needed. And there's our contact information, and this is uh, Todd's book, uh, Stand Back and Deliver. Um, he's my boss, so I guess I gotta promote it. Um, this is Todd's talk originally, yeah. so we're, we're adopting. <laughs> I just, I, I wanna make sure, I don't know if I made it sound like IC Agile doesn't do the learning thing. That's actually why we're looking at IC Agile, is because it has an embedded like learning aspect to it. All right, so I'm sure we stirred up lots of controversy. Um, I think it's the theme for today, so there was lots of good questions we'd really like to discuss maybe offline, and, and um, I'm sorry we couldn't answer all of them um, as part of the talk, but we do want to have that discussion, so please find us outside afterwards. Thanks for listening us to us ramble for 45 minutes. That was yeah. fun. We've got some time to take questions? Okay.
Okay, two, two questions? Okay, or maybe we should readdress the questions that people have already had. Well, I, I mean, there's 15 minutes till the next talk, so if people do want to go, I don't want to. Okay. But we'll stick around and ask questions. So. Yeah. yeah, if you need to go, please feel free now, and, but we will stay up here and answer a couple questions. Oh, sorry, you forgot, we got a question here first. Oh, in the service industry. <laughs> so in a service industry, they're largely based on, uh, I don't work in a service industry. I work in a product development company. Um, so I can't say I'm an expert on it. What I do know is, or my understanding is, a lot of it is based on firm fixed price contracts, right? Firm fixed price contracts are fundamentally based on distrust, in my view. They are risk transference. The company that is purchasing the contract, or like wants, wants bids, is saying, I don't want the risk, I want to transfer all that risk to, to the company doing the work because I don't trust them, therefore I want a fixed date, I want a fixed scope. I, I think that's fundamentally at odds with the, the manifesto and customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And, and a lot of the dysfunctions in Waterfall we saw, or the, and, and how Waterfall evolved in the first place was to try and make these types of contracts successful. I'm thinking like IT organizations where people are evaluated on, on their, how quickly they close uh, a request or a, a service request. Um, so I've had, I've had these, I've sent, I've sent service requests to an IT group, um, you know, They'll, they'll do exactly what I asked them to do because that's what they're being, you know, that's what they're being uh, evaluated on, not, yeah. not did they meet my underlying need or, or solve it in a different and better way. I think if you're building long-term relationships and building trust over long-term and you care about that and you value that, then um, you can do that in service organizations. You can build established relationships because people are happy with the ultimate outcomes. They understand you care about their outcomes and the plan might change um, and that's, that's okay. But um, I think that's the type of environment I like to work in. I'm not sure how I'm that I'm also might, not an expert at that. So I'm not yeah. an expert on that. There might be other experts here who can raise their hand and talk afterwards. Another question? Is there one, sorry, one thing? All right, thank you guys. That was a lot of fun. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the talks today. <laughs> oh yeah, we'll, we'll be here all day, all week. Yeah, yeah, we're all week. Thank you.